Uh, the, the sermon today is going to be a little bit different to usual. I'm going to explain how this is going to work. One of the uh, biggest misunderstandings that there is, and important questions that comes up, is the relationship between faith and obedience. And um, on the one hand, we have trusting, just simply trusting. On the other hand, we have doing things. How do these relate? Well, uh, uh, if being saved is only about how well you keep God's laws, how well you perform, then we call that legalism. However, if you can live however you want, providing you trust Jesus that you'll be forgiven, you can do whatever you want, we call that antinomianism, and that literally means against the law. One of the people I know who has done the best work in this area is Don Gullington. And so I asked him to do some teaching on this subject today. Uh, he's presenting his material in seven parts, is very solid teaching. And so I thought it would be good for me to, good for us to pause between each part and go over what we've learned. And so we're ready for the next part that follows. So, first of all, here's an overview of what Don is going to bring to us today. We're going to look at obedience, obedience and faith in the Bible. First of all, the Old Testament, we're going to look at um, Hebrew words for faith and obedience. What did they have to obey? What exactly was it they had to obey? And then obedience and the nation, the big story. Then we're going to move to the New Testament and look at the Gospel and Acts, then move on to Paul in Romans, then look at the rest of Paul's writings, and then finally look at other epistles. So then, let's start with the Old Testament, faith in the Old Testament. Yeah, well, greetings to everyone. Very glad to be with you again today. And so we're going to consider the obedience of faith in the whole Bible action. We'll take it into two sections, the uh, Old Testament and New. That stands to reason, I suppose. So as, first of all, for faith in the Old Testament, uh, faith isn't merely belief in or assent to a given set of propositions as expressed especially by the word emuna, the Hebrew word emuna, faith is both active and passive at the same time. Uh, the import of the active sense of emuna is trust and obedience, while the passive sense signifies the condition of sustained trust and obedience, which is trustworthiness. Now, in this basis, it's artificial to distinguish between faith and obedience. Now, there's a writer named Perry, whom I'll quote at length here, <clears throat> it is to be noted from the study of this word that the Old Testament does not set trust and obedience in contrast to each other as separate ways of satisfying the demands of God. Amuna comprehends the totality of what we commonly mean in the familiar expression faith and works. Obedience without trust is not the obedience that God requires. Only the obedience of trust is reckoned to man as righteousness, and everything else is exposed for the sham that it is, lying when words, false lips, and deceitful ways. Conversely, trust inevitably expresses itself in action. <coughs> trust in the Lord and do good are two aspects of the same act of will by which man is declared righteous. End of the quote. And so, in biblical thinking, to speak of faith is to speak of obedience. Faith and obedience are one action. Faith has to be proven by obedience. And now moving on to obedience itself. <coughs> Properly speaking, there is no word for obey in the Hebrew language. The English word, along with terms like heed or listen to, is an attempt to draw out an idea implicit in the Hebrew word shema, which means to hear. And now another quote, this time from a man named F.W. Young. To really hear God's word inevitably, inevitably involves one in an obedience response in action, prompted by faithfulness to and faith in God who is revealing himself in and through particular historical events. 
Not to respond in obedient action is tantamount to unbelief, and so the prophet chastises his people for their blind eyes and deaf ears, that's Isaiah 6, which betray their faithlessness. This inevitable consequence of failing to hear is rebellion or disobedience. But rebellion is not just <clears throat> the willful disobedience of one who has heard. Rebellion is the sign that one has really not heard, since to hear implies a faith obedience response. So we've been looking at these Hebrew words for faith and obedience. And both of the words here are used in Hebrew combine the ideas of faith and obedience into one. And not only not to obey shows a lack of faith and that you've not even really heard God. So very clearly in these Old Testament words and the way they're used, there's not like a sharp distinction between faith as being something intellectual and and uh, actions and obedience being something you do and they're you know separate those they're, they're combined they're thought of as being two aspects of the same thing even the very way that the words are used so we now come to the question what is it that they had to obey what was actually the the nature of the the obedience that they had to have well we're going to look at three things we, first of all, we're going to look at the voice of God, obeying the voice of God, and that's an expression that's used frequently in the Old Testament. Then, his laws and commandments. And then finally, the connection between this uh, obeying and, and trusting and the covenant. And we're going to see how the, the covenant is really important where it comes in here. Now, the voice of God is the primary reference point of the godly Israelites' obedience. Now, that's why hearing on the part of humans assumes a role of primary importance. From a certain point of view, as we said, hearing is obedience. The first man's primal act of disobedience consisted in his listening to the voice of his wife, not the voice of God. Abraham's obedience, on the other hand, was precisely his willingness to hear God's voice. Now, the voice of God is often equated with his law or laws, commandments, and statutes. Uh, lots of references like Genesis 25, Exodus 15, uh, Deuteronomy 13. <coughs> Giving heed to his voice and hearing his commandments are regarded as one and the same activity. Uh, not to hearken to his voice is sin and rebellion, and again, lots of references in the Old Testament. That means that Israel's obedience or disobedience is measured in proportion to her doing or not doing the revealed will of God. And consequently, obedience lies at the root of sacrifice. Now, there's the uh, famous passage, 1 Samuel 15, 22. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great a delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than to sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. <coughs> now, this, uh, obedience and disobedience, there's a slash between the two, obedience slash disobedience, uh, is a concept very much associated with the covenant idea. In Exodus 19.5, obedience is correlated with keeping the covenant. And on the other hand, disobedience is said to be covenant-breaking br uh, in passages like uh, Judges 2, 2 Kings 18, Jeremiah 13. Thus, to be obedient is to be a covenant keeper, and to be disobedient is to be a covenant breaker. <coughs> in addition, uh, the blessings and the cursings of the covenant relationship are said to be the consequence of obedience or disobedience, respectively. Uh, in the case of Abraham and Isaac, the blessings of the covenant are renewed because Abraham obeyed God, Genesis 22 and 26. As regards Israel, the promises of blessing and the threats of the cursing are directly contingent on the nation's obedience or disobedience. <clears throat> now, in this way, the conditionality of the Sinai covenant is underscored. Everything depended on the response of Israel as the human partner of the covenant. Uh, later, when the prophets conclude that Israel is incapable of responding to the Lord's voice, there emerges the figure of a servant 
who, according to Isaiah 42, receives, uh, receives the Spirit of God and establishes justice in the earth. He is set over against the servant nation who would not obey God's laws, and it's he who has made a covenant for the people. Isaiah 42, 6. <clears throat> well, in view of the covenant context of obedience, it comes as no surprise that Israel is constantly uh, summoned to listen to the voice of the Lord. And although the, cha the charges were repeatedly made that Israel has not listened, God's desire remains unchanged. Oh, that my people would listen to me, that Israel would walk in my ways. Psalm uh, 81. Well, consequently, the call for Israel to give heed, that is to obey, becomes one of the major burdens of the prophetic movement. In fact, in a very real sense, that's what the prophets are all about. <clears throat> now, in several texts, obedience slash disobedience is uh, connected with faith and, uh, and uh, slash unbelief. In Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believes God in a time of testing. And in Genesis 22, 18, his supreme test is complemented by his obedience to the voice of God. Hence, we can say in obedience of faith, a listening to the Lord's voice, which eventuates in righteous behavior according to the covenant. Now, on the other hand, Israel's rebellion against God's commandments in Deuteronomy 9.23 is attributed to her failure to believe in him and obey his voice. According to Psalm 106, verses 25, uh, 24 to 25, Israel despised the pleasant land because she had no faith in God's promises. And by murmuring in their tents, the people did not obey the voice of God. And again, those two things are tantamount to each other. Well, the prophet Zephaniah laments over Jerusalem, the rebellious and the defiled city, as she's called. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She doesn't trust in the Lord, and she doesn't draw near to her God. Hence, a disobedience of unbelief. A disobedience consisting in unbelief and a rebellion against the Lord commensurate with distrust of him. That brings us almost to the end of the Old Testament teaching. And these verses really uh, bring us, really reinforce the connection between uh, obedience and faith. And there we can see them in Abraham, we can see them in the nation as a whole. And um, the in the last part, as we go come into the end of our looking at the Old Testament, we're going to look more at the big story of what God was doing with his people because Israel were not doing a good job in terms of trusting God and obeying what was going to happen. So obedience and the nation, the big story, and we're going to look at how eventually Gentile nations will be brought into obedience and faith and this will bring in a new kingdom. <coughs> Next, like Abraham, testing forms the context of Israel's obedience slash disobedience. We have Judges 3, 4, for example, which relates that the nations left in Canaan were for the purpose of testing Israel to know whether she would obey the commandments of the Lord. The design of God to test the people in the land represents an extension of the same purpose in the wilderness. For example, Deuteronomy 8, 2. Yet the consistent witness of the Old Testament is that Israel failed the test. According to Jeremiah 7, 28, the nation did not accept God's discipline. She was disobedient. Instead of being tested and found faithful, she put God to the test and rebelled against him. And that's a motif that comes out in the uh, testings of Christ in the wilderness. Well, after a period of exile due to her disobedience, Israel will, in the end, become obedient, Deuteronomy 4.30. At that time, the people will call to God, and he will answer, Jeremiah 29.12. Uh, well, the king, in several passages, this reference is made, and the servant of the Lord are singled out as persons to be obeyed because they represent God. Well, the, uh, the Gentiles also feature in God's program for an obedient nation. <clears throat> like Israel, they're summoned to listen to the voice of the Lord. 
on the day that he extends his hand to recover his people from exile, they will become a conquering power. Their hand will be against Edom and Moab, and the Ammonites will obey them. According to Daniel's vision of the saints of the Most High, the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, and all dominions shall serve and obey them. Well, these passages set forth the expectation that Gentiles would eventually become <coughs> obedient subjects of a renewed Israelite kingdom. They are to be incorporated into the kingdom of God and, along with Israel, make their pilgrimage up to the holy city. And that's famously said in Isaiah 2 and Micah chapter 4. <coughs> and now, at least in two passages, Psalm 103 and Daniel 7, 27, obedience is depicted as a characteristic of the kingdom of God. <coughs> well, that's just a rapid survey of the Old Testament. Now we come to the New. Well, we're, we've been through the Old Testament now. We've been looking at Hebrew words for faith and obedience, and we saw that just built into the Hebrew language is the idea that these two are not somehow separate, but they are really deeply connected. We saw um, how that what the Israelites were called to obey was God's voice, God's commandments. His, he called them into a covenant with him, which was for their obedience. And then we, we saw um, that there was a big story that God had, that he was planning eventually to have a kingdom. He would bring it in through the perfect servant, who is, of course, Jesus Christ, who would be the one who obeyed, and through his obedience, we would be will be brought in to obedience. Not just Israel, but the whole world, Gentiles included, would be brought into this kingdom of obedience. So we've looked at that. Now we're going to move on to the New Testament, and we're going to look at the Gospel and Acts, and then we're going to look at Paul in the book of Romans, then Paul's other letters, and finish up with the other epistles. First of all, there are the Gospels. Uh, the foundation for obedience in the New Testament is laid by Christ's experience in the wilderness. Immediately after the baptism, he's impelled into the wilderness. In fact, in Mark's account, it's quite graphic. It says literally that he picked him up and threw him into the wilderness. And so that was the, such of the force. Uh, of the calling. And so he's impelled into the wilderness and their face is testing as the Son of God by the hand of Satan. And we have that in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. <coughs> well, the temptations revolved around three issues. The turning of stones into bread, God's protection of his Son, and the inheritance of the kingdoms of the world. In each instance, Jesus refused to acknowledge Satan as his God by means of quotations from Scripture. Only God is to be worshipped and to serve. And he quotes Deuteronomy 6 and Deuteronomy 8. <coughs> well, subsequently in the Synoptic Gospels, Satan's testing in the wilderness is continued by his agents, the Jewish leaders. And so it's they who continue throughout the public ministry what Satan initiated in the wilderness. And so in so doing, the, the gospel writers picture them as the instruments of the devil in his ongoing attack on Jesus. They, as their mentors, put to the trust the Lord their God in satanic fashion. And that's very strong stuff when you begin to uh, accuse others of being sat satanic in their intentions and their outlook. But it does so all the while, not nevertheless. Well, John's Gospel, in its own way, takes up the obedience motif. A uh, particular note there is John 5, 19. The Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever he does, the Son does likewise. And so the Son is cast in the role of the image bearer of God, that is, the one who imitates God in his obedience. And that's what bearing the image is all about anyway, imitating God, imitating his example, and doing the way that he does. <coughs> now, in the book of Acts, and there's Acts 5, 27 to 32, the apostles are summoned for the council and charged not to teach in the name of Jesus, 
<coughs> As the sp spokesperson for the group is Peter, who asserts, we must obey God rather than men. Uh, Peter's defiance is backed up by the further declaration, we are witnesses to these things, and so is also the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. Now later in Acts 6, 7, the number of, of disciples greatly uh, multiplied in Jerusalem, and even a great many of the priests became obedient to the way. And that must have been quite an earth-shaking experience with the preacher's establishment. Well, by way of contrast, in Acts uh, 7, 35 to 53, Stephen charges contemporary Israel with the same disobedience as their ancestors, that is to say, idolatry. Only this time, the idolatry has become the temple itself. And so, uh, again, very shockingly, the temple is the new object of idolatry. And so... Uh, you can understand why when Peter finished his speech that they rushed toward him and threw him, <laughs> threw him down and, and stoned him with stones because you couldn't allow something like that to go unchallenged. So that was the Gospel and Acts. It's very interesting to see how the New Testament so freely uses the expression obedience to describe salvation. And we see this in this uh, slide here that the the in Acts six seven, the salvation of the priests is described as obedience to the faith, and so um, obedience can't be the same as legalism. In fact, um, on the previous slide, we had the Holy Spirit given to those who obey Him. Uh, there it is. Um, uh, we're witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. So this is, a, this is quite remarkable how the Bible doesn't split these things up, but actually links them together. Now we come to the book of Romans, um, and uh, we see here this spelled out the clearest, and I'll tell you a secret, Don did his PhD in on this very topic, the obedience of faith in the book of Romans. So uh, this material here is of the highest quality. Now when we come to Paul, uh, a letter to the Romans is especially distinguished by the obedience-disobedience motif. Uh, the letter is bracketed by 1, 5 and 16, 26, which talks about the obedience of faith among all the nations. Now, we can add that to uh, the following passages. You have 1.8, your faith is proclaimed in all the world, as uh, coupled by 16.19, your obedience is known to all. Then there is 10.16a, uh, but not all have obeyed the gospel. And the next part of the verse says, for Isaiah says, who has believed our report. And you have 11, 20 through, uh, 23, 30, and 31. <coughs> if they do not remain in unbelief by their disobedience, so now they have become disobedient. And then 1, 5 again, the obedience of faith among all the nations, and 15, 18, to win obe obedience from the nations. Now, the verb obey also occurs in several other passages in Romans, like chapter 2 and uh, 6 and 10. <coughs> or not obedience is found in Romans 6, 16 and 16, 19. The adjective obedient occurs in 6, 17. And the corresponding terms disobedience and disobedient occur in 5, 9 and 11, 30, 32. Well, that was a very quick um, run through. I hope you caught that. Uh, Paul uses the word obedient interchangeably with having faith. It's simply not possible to have faith in Jesus without committing to follow him. In fact, when Jesus preached the gospel, he said, follow me. That was his gospel message. Note that Paul never says perfectly obedient. He never says you've got to measure up to this standard of obedience. It's about your commitment rather than your performance. It's your commitment to obey him rather than measuring up to some level of, of standard. 
And now we're going to look at at 2 Corinthians, Galatians and Philippians, where there is some really helpful material. Um, These are Paul's other epistles that we're going to look at. um, And we're going to particularly look at those three places. Now, in the other Pauline letters, obedience pertains to various social relationships. You know, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Galatians uh, 5, 7. Now, the converse is disobedience toward God and humans. And uh, three passages in particular stand out. <clears throat> There's uh, 2 Corinthians 5, uh, sorry, 10, 5 to 6. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle to the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. complete. Now, before the writing of this letter, the Corinthians had, quote, obeyed Titus, and by implication Paul himself, after the delivery of what's been called historically the severe letter. We don't know if that still exists or not, but it may be part of Second Corinthians. And now their obedience needs to be placed beyond question. So they've done fine up to a certain point, but they have to top it all off with continued obedience. Uh, presumably their total obedience would be achieved when they cease to support the super apostles. Now they're the unbelievers. And Paul talks about in, in chapter 6. And Paul uh, and Paul would not give them un, any unqualified support. Now in Galatians 5, 7, you were running well, who hindered you from obeying the truth. The effect of the Judaizers' influence in Galatia is that the readers were in the process of not obeying the truth, which is the truth of a circumcised free gospel. And that's what it really means in Galatians, in the context. <laughs> and so if you don't submit to the, the, the gospel of circumcision, then you're being an obedient person. Now, Paul thought of obedience of the gospel as a matter of mind and intellect, as a sink from what we call a leap into the dark. And there are lots who make leaps into the dark and where they, they fall off, where they fall finally is anyone's guess. It's an experience that has to engage one's full mental capacities. <clears throat> now, to this end, that Paul brought his whole arsenal of arguments in the letter to the end that he might convince the readers of the veracity of his preaching of Christ because a persuasion is meant to result in obedience. Now, the truth is not to be believe, believe only, but to be obeyed as well. Uh, truth is a package deal, as we call it. It's not only commitment to Christ, but the obedience of faith resulting from union with him. One ever has to be in submission to the truth. <clears throat> then there's Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For God is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, Gordon Fee uh, comments along these lines. He says, as this letter to the Romans makes clear, (coughs) for Paul, faith in Christ is ultimately expressed as obedience to Christ not in the sense of following the rules, but of coming totally under his lordship, of being devoted to him completely. This is the only obedience to his words that Paul cares anything about. And again, that's very well said by by Gordon Fee. I think that quote from Gordon Fee really sums it up very well. I'm just going to read it again. Um, For Paul, faith in Christ is ultimately expressed in obedience to Christ, not in the sense of following the rules, but of coming totally under his lordship, of being devoted completely to him. And so it's not about performance being perfect, but the question is, who is your Lord? Back in the 1980s, there was something in the US called the lordship controversy. And this is what happened. There were some huge evangelistic campaigns and 
large numbers of people, massive numbers of people were were filling out cards saying they putting a mark on saying they'd chosen to follow Jesus. They'd become Christians. And these evangelistic campaigns were saying, you know, we've we've had we've seen you no know, ten thousand people saved today and fifty thousand saved yesterday and making all these claims for a number of questions. But when people looked into it, they found that actually these people didn't well some of them were, were very genuinely converted, but there were others who there was no change in their lifestyle at all. They didn't start going to church or behaving any differently. And so this is a question, were they saved or not? And so the, the, the debate was something like this. One side said, um, you know what? Being a Christian is about making Jesus your Lord. And if Jesus wasn't their Lord, it doesn't matter what they'd signed on a decision card because he needs to be their Lord. And the other side said, hang on a minute, you're turning this into works. It's, if they had faith, it doesn't matter what they do in their lives, they're saved. That's all that counts. And so it became a very um, uh, tense debate. Um, but quite clearly, Jesus, no, oh, sorry, the, 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 the ones who believed in, you know, these people were saved, says there's two levels of Christians. There's Christians who, who believe and they'll get into heaven by the skin of their teeth. And there's Christians who then take Jesus as, your Lord, as their Lord. So there's two steps to becoming a Christian. Uh, the first step is is faith, and then you're, you're you're into heaven, but that's all. And then the second step is taking Jesus as your Lord, and then you're like you're fully you enjoy the benefits of being a Christian. Um, well, this might explain the figures they got from their evangelism, but it didn't. It's not there in the Bible, and the Bible is really clear that to be a Christian is to have Jesus as your Lord, and you can't just split it up into two steps in this kind of way. Um, but sadly, that's what happened. And now we come to the last part of this message, and we're going to look at the rest of the New Testament. Now, in the letter to the Hebrews, uh, it falls in line with the other New Testament documents, which is obedience is perseverance in faith. Uh, the precedent for obedience is set by Christ, who learned through what he suffered. Now, for this reason, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who believe him, Hebrews 5, 9. Now, before Christ, <coughs> the paradigm of obedience was set by Abraham. He's the one who obeyed God, and he was called out to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance, Hebrews 11, 8. And the practical outworking of the believer's obedience is seen in their submission to their leaders, 3.17. The converse of such obedience is disobedience, that is, tantamount to apostasy, 2.2 2 and 4.6 and 11. <clears throat> now, in 1 Peter, according to this letter, according to chapter 1, verse 2, believers are chosen and sanctified with a view to obedience to Christ. It's they who have purified their souls by obedience to the truth, 1.22, in keeping with such obedience, Christian wives are to be submissive to their husbands, following the example of Sarah in chapter 3, 5 to 6. Unbelief is characterized as disobedience to the word, which is stated several times in the letter. And finally, there is 1 John. <coughs> John can speak of doing the truth, 1 John 1, 6. He characterizes disobedience to the commandments as a form of lying the converse of keeping God's word and loving him. The proof positive that one is a child of God is obedience to the commands. So we've been on quite a journey today uh, in such a short space of time. And just to review it, uh, we've started in the Old Testament. We looked at how the Hebrew words for faith and obedience um, really can't be separated into a, like an intellectual ascent and doing something in practice. If you really believe, you will obey, you'll follow God. And then we saw that God, it was God's voice and his words that they had to obey and how God had a plan to bring obedience to uh, the nations through his servant, Jesus, who would then bring the Gentiles in and 
establish the kingdom, which would be a place of faith and obedience. And then we saw in the New Testament, the Gospels, we saw Jesus, who was the one who was tempted, was tested in the wilderness, and he obeyed, and he, he did the will of the Father, always, never failed to do the will of the Father. And then we saw in Acts how we see Peter saying, you know, we need to obey God rather than men, and that discussion about the priests uh, that, who were saved, but it said that they, that they um, obeyed the gospel. And uh, then we saw Paul in Romans, and those verses that just so completely mix up and, and uh, treat as the same thing, obedience and faith, and how they're the same thing, and Paul just uses them, those beautiful expressions, bringing together trusting Jesus and following Jesus as the same thing. And we saw this continue in his other letters, and then finally in those other epistles that we looked at. So I'm going to end by looking at that quote again from Gordon Fee. For Paul, faith in Christ is ultimately expressed as obedience to Christ, not in the sense of following the rules, but of coming totally under his lordship, of being devoted completely to him. So I think the most important question we can take away from this is, is every area of my life under the lordship of Jesus? Or am I failing to trust him in some area? Because if there's some area that we're not following Jesus, we're not obeying his will, it's because we don't trust him with that area. They amount to the same thing. So I would just challenge you to examine where how your trust in Jesus extends to following him in every part of your life. So thank you, Don, very much for su dealing with such an important subject. Um, and uh, uh, wouldn't you say that people often put obedience of faith as opposites to one another? Isn't that often the case? Yeah, that's right, exactly. And uh, and then you know it's obedience is all about being legalistic. Yeah. And faith is some kind of vague. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And what you've really shown is, in fact, um, that, uh, that, that obedience is an act of faith. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Sure it is. Yeah. 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 You know, the obedience of faith. Right. Sure. Right. And um, and that's why when Paul sums up his his ministry, his mission. To the Gentiles, he can frame it like that. <laughs> and there's some who uh, want to bifurcate faith and obedience, and right. you know, and that that's the mistake that we're trying to right. to rectify. And what you would say is a faith that consists in obedience. Yeah, exactly. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So we express our faith by by obedience. Yeah. 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 So how would you like? How would you say we could respond personally to this message in our lives? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, we persevere in the faith, and then we live lives uh, to which uh, we, were, we were called to be. Some might say obedience to what in the New Testament? Well, to Christ in the first instance, but to Christ and his word. Right. Yeah, both yes. together. Yes. So, um, the way then to exercise faith is by doing what Christ said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas uh, yeah. some people would like, it, like to leave it completely as a, like an abstract belief. But yeah. what you're saying is, yeah. you know, it actually is something that's Oh, yeah. Cool. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. That's perfect, yeah. Yeah, in John 15. Yeah. That's exactly perfect. right. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, that's not a legalistic thing. It's simply <laughs> doing the will of Christ. Doing the will of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you so much. It's uh, been a yeah. 